One of the most powerful keys that we have been given as believers is our ability to access heaven while we are on the earth. A lot of people believe that we have to wait until we die before we can access heaven. But scripture is clear. We have been seated in Christ in heavenly places. We have been born again from above. We are citizens of heaven. To help us understand this reality and live out of the fullness of this truth, I've gone and interviewed people around the world who are really experiencing this on a daily basis. I hope that as you watch this video, that the mysteries of the kingdom are unlocked in your life. Enjoy. Do we as believers have access to heaven? We as believers have access to heaven. I believe that when the Bible says we were, past tense, seated in heavenly places, it wasn't speaking about a future event in the past tense. It's already happened. When we accepted Christ, we were seated in heavenly places. That means we have access. I think that the greatest detriment in the body of Christ is a lack of knowledge of our unhindered, unlimited, unrestricted, unconfined access into Yahweh's world. It's one of the things that, that Christ did when he passed through death. The word is very clear that he tore the veil. And the reason he tore the veil was that we as believers are called the priests of God. And the reason that we're called priests is, is because we are supposed to have access to Yahweh himself to be able to enjoy not only relational connection, but functionality as a being within Yahweh's world. My, my whole life is not about hoping that one day I'm going to go to heaven and be worshipping God for the rest of my life. My hope is that I'm going to be in the service of Yahweh in all of creation, doing what Yahweh requires of me in that time. And so, do we have access to heaven? Absolutely we do. And not only do we have access, the, the thing that I love, I so love about what Christ did for us when he went through the birthing chamber of death to show us the grave, was that he became our priest which means that I don't have to make myself clean to be in heaven. If Christ is my priest and the job of the priest is to make the sacrifice clean and my job is to present myself in my father's world to be made clean and there become clean here. And so that's, the, that's just what I call the byproduct of going into Yahweh's world is to be able to see this administrated and see facilitated creation. So I have a lot of people that say to me, oh, you can't go into heaven. Well, it's too late. I've been doing it for 20 years. So yes, yes, we can go and absolutely we can. And it's unrestricted, unconfined, unlimited and unhindered. It's a way in through Christ. He is the door and the function of the door is to go through it. Yes. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the door, I've gone in advance, opened the door and prepared the way for you that wherever I am, you may be also. Because Jesus is not limited to time, but rather time lives in him. That means wherever he is, past, present or future, we may be also because he's in us and we're in him. Therefore, if he's not limited to time or space or distance or location, Neither are we, because we're in Him. Therefore, we can be wherever He wants us to be at any particular time. He's the God who was, the God who is, the God who ever shall be, all at one time. Therefore, we are now without limitation in where we can find ourselves to be in praise and worship in His name. John 10, 9 says, I am the door. By me, if any man enters in, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and shall go out to find pasture. Going in and going out, to me, expresses the terminology of having open access to the door of Revelation chapter 4. John 14, 3 says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you unto myself, that wherever I am, you may be also. Therefore, we have open access to the heavenly realms at this time, which is causing and bringing about the beginning of the new mystical move of God in the earth. Yeah, because Jesus says, where I am, there you will be also. And he says, I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And we pray our Father who art in heaven. So if we have access to Christ, we have access to the Father. We have access to heaven. You cannot have access to God and His Son and the Holy Spirit without having access to the atmosphere in which they live. So the heavens are open to the sons of God. What does that look like to you? It looks like having access to what Jesus had access to. Through relationship to the Father, we are able to navigate the depths of God's heart from a heavenly perspective. Not on earth, but in heaven, operating from heaven toward earth to make earth what looks like heaven. But what it looks like to me is a face-to-face -face encounter with Christ and Christ revealing to me the dimensions of the Father's realm. Actually, He shows me things about the Father. He shows me the Father's structure, shows me the angels that work with Him, shows me what the Father has planned for me even here on earth, shows me how, the, how, how Him, the Father, and the Holy Spirit work on earth and show me the pattern of why that happens on earth. Because when you know Christ, Christ draws you into understanding the structures and the patterns of the Father's intention. So what it looks to me like is, I have a vision of God. I have a vision of Christ. But more than that, my soul and my spirit gets drawn into the presence of Christ. I have intimacy with God, which means I have connection with angelic structures, I have connection with God's pattern of movement in creation. So intimacy with God is much more than just saying, Lord, I love you. It's actually engaging and connecting with the heart of God. So it looks to me as a face-to-face, -face, like a face-to-face -face relationship. It's in fact, not that it's looked to me. It is in fact a face-to-face -face encounter, a revelation of the realms of the Father, a revelation of the intent of my Father's heart. So even on earth, when I look at things on earth, I see them as a gateway to see what Christ has redeemed the world for. So it's, it's deeper than just saying, I, I see heaven. I do see heaven, but there's an engagement that draws my soul into the world of the Father. Well, heaven is an awesome, awesome place. There are no words to explain how incredibly beautiful and amazing it is. Just when I think that I've seen everything that there is to see, he takes me to places I've never seen before. And when I think I've heard all there is to hear, he reveals things that I've never heard before. Right now, he's revealing mysteries that have been hidden in him since the very beginning. Heaven is an awesome, magnificent, beautiful place, and I would invite anybody to ascend and see for themselves. The framework of Yahweh's world is as important and as significant as the physical world that we live in here. The realm of the kingdom of our Father is not just a blank empty space. It is full of substance. It's a substance that we in the physical world are unable to perceive because of the way that our natural eye engages to frame this world around us. I've done lots of teachings on, on some of this stuff, but the way that we frame this world is by measuring photons of light to be able to frame a physical world around us. And we frame this world, we build this, literally build this world out of neuron, neuron tree memories that are cultured from when we come out of the womb. Yahweh's world is no different. Yahweh's world has substance in it. Everything in the physical world has come out of Yahweh's world. And what's in the physical world is just a reflection or a shadow of what is in Yahweh's world. So in Genesis 1, when the word says that God said, let there be light, and he saw the light, the light was good, out of his observation of light in his world, the whole of creation was framed out of the image of what he was observing. And so in our Father's world, there are, you know, even Christ said, in my Father's world, there are many mansions or many dimensions or however interpretation you want to put on it, the, the issue is that world is full of stuff. It has the angelic world and it has the men of white linen and it has the, has the cloud of witnesses. It has the, the functionality of his throne. I mean, even, even Moses in the Old Testament, when he took the 70 up into the mountain of God, which was a natural mountain, then became a spiritual mountain. 
um, they had a table. They walked on a sapphire paper with a stone. The whole of the heavens were open up. There was gold and glory and beauty and there was substance there. And it's framed out of creative light. We, we frame this out of created light. So to me, it's, it's as real as this. And at least that world is permanent. This one is not. This world is going to pass away. So if we think that this world is the framework for that, we're fantasizing. There is another world that Yahweh has put in place for us to be functional within and to be a partaker and a participator in that world. And it is, it's amazing. It's, it's very, very relevant for today, particularly with regards to our future. Isn't heaven a place we go to when we die? <laughs> oh, then heaven must be the grave. <laughs> Because if it's about death, then the grave is the salvation. But the Bible says that the grave is a prison because death and the grave are our enemies. So it cannot be death that leads us into heaven. It must be the life of Christ that leads us to heaven. The, the, the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. So when I believe in Jesus Christ, I become alive. So if where he is, that's where I, I am also. If I'm connected with Christ by my faith in Him, by my interconnection and relationship with Him into the Father through the Holy Spirit, right? That means that I'm not waiting to die to experience heaven. And by the way, in the Hebrew, heaven is not a singular term, it's what? It's a plural term. So the heavens of the heavens of the heavens belong to God. So if I'm in relationship with the Father, it is the Father's good pleasure to reveal to me the realms of his being. It revealed to me, I, angels work with me. So if, if I'm waiting to die to get to heaven, then I should wait to die to deal with angels. Because angels interact with the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. So no, no, no. Death is not my salvation. Christ, the living Christ, is my salvation. Life is my salvation. Death is not the door into heaven, Jesus is. Jesus said, I am the door. That means when he comes into my heart and I give my life over to him, I have access into where he is. And so, no, I don't have to wait to die to go to heaven. I have access to heaven right now, just like he did. Christ has given us unrestricted access into heaven now. I found it so fascinating. And I, and I hear this a lot of times in the body of Christ. People say, only one day when you die will you go to heaven. Only one day when you die will you see heaven. Only one day when you die will you, will you see angels. Only one day when you die will you see Christ in heaven. Only one day when you die will you, will you see the throne. Well, in the Old Testament, they saw all this before they died. So that's in the Old Testament. How much more freer is the access to what we have now to be able to go there and enjoy that world and that arena now? It's now, at where the words that Christ said, where I am, you may be also. If Christ is, is not in heaven, then what's, what's the point of coming to salvation? What is there that is on the earth to keep me longing to be there? So my, my, one of my, my little pet hates, I think, within the, and I hate a strong word, one of my pet dislikes in the body of Christ is where we assume that creation is not heaven and that is completely unscriptural. When Yahweh framed all of creation and it says he created the universe, when he framed it in existence, he called it all heaven. What right have we got to take the earth out of heaven? Just because we see it as an entity that is in a state of collapse and chaos, it's still in heaven. Heaven is not some ethereal world that is far, far away where no man has been before. Christ said the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand, which means it's as close to you as the air that you breathe, and we have access into it. Well, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, the answer is empirically yes. But my question is, why would you want to wait until you die if you can have open access to the heavenly realms today? Why not go right now and bask in his ever-living, ever-loving presence? Matthew 10, verse 7 says, As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Luke 17, 21, neither say, lo here, lo there. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Matthew 3, 2, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is within you. Matthew 13, 11, he answered and said unto them, because it's given unto us to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Therefore, it is time for us to go through that open door of Revelation 4 so that we can acknowledge and see what the Father's doing to advance his kingdom and his righteousness. Can we access heaven at will? I believe we can access heaven at will through relationship. In other words, we know what the Father desires, we know what the Father's doing, we see what the Father's doing, and we access heavenly realms and also everything that heaven has available to assist us in our assignments and to enable us to do what we're called to do through relationship with the Father. So just like the Lord Jesus when he lived on the earth was able to see what the Father was doing, do what the Father was doing, and have at will access into heavenly realms and angels and chancellors and men in white linen and all these different things, so do we. Yeah. The same way we can have faith at will. We don't have faith when God comes upon us. Faith is a human activity empowered by the grace of God. I can choose to believe God or not believe God. So if I actually believe there is a heaven, so I can actually access it at will, but I need training to be able to do so. I need, I need training to be able to access that. I come through Christ. But every relationship I have with Jesus Christ is, is by will. Everything I do with Christ, I do by will. So I could choose tomorrow not to talk to Jesus. He could appear to me and I can actually will not to talk to him. So my, the will that God gave me is a sovereign power in me that allows me to connect with God and access what God has for me. So my goal then is to develop a good will, to train my will to be able to access what the Father intends for me. So I can really access God at will. Can I call God anytime I want? Yes? So pray without season. Call upon him at any time he will answer you. That's what we preach, right? So if I can at will call God, why can't I at will go to the presence of God? And if I can at will go to the presence of God, why can't I at will go to heaven? Matthew 7 and also again in Luke 11, 9, it says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened up to you. The word says in Matthew 21, Whatsoever things we ask in the name of Jesus, believing and not doubting, we shall have it. Therefore, my way of attaining to the heavenly realms is number one, ask for whatsoever things we ask in his name, believing and not doubting, we shall have it. Number two, seek. It depends on the depths of our desire and the intentionality of our heart as to how far we will seek a heavenly experience. But when we seek it, the word says, we shall find it. Knock, and the door of Revelation 4 will be opened to us. Therefore, my encouragement to all people is ask, seek, and knock, and the door will be opened to you. I don't think it has anything to do with our will. Our will is surrendered. It's one of the biggest arguments in the body of Christ is this issue of my sovereignty or my ability to do something by my own choice. We do have that, but my will is surrendered to do the my will of my Father. So in doing His will, I have access there. It's not by my will I go, but it's out of desire. What is everything you desire when you pray, ask and you receive. So my will has nothing to do with it. My will is surrendered to do my Father's will. As far as I'm concerned, my Father's will is not just on the earth. It is in heaven also, because it says all of creation is groaning for our revealing. So that means two trillion galaxies are waiting for our supervision. Um, that span 34 billion light years across, you know, whatever. So for me, it's not about our will. It's about our desire, about our intent that unleashes faith and hope to believe 
for the future. So my life and my future isn't on the earth. But to have an inheritance on the earth, I need to learn how to function in my father's house, which is in heaven. What does it mean to be a citizen of heaven? For me, it means that we represent heaven, that we operate in whatever dimension of life we're operating in, for example, right now on the earth, as representatives of another kingdom, one that is not fully manifest in the visible realm right now on the earth, but is very much active all around us. And as citizens of heaven, just like as citizens of a nation, when we are not in that particular place where that government is set up, it's still operating within us and we're still operating as representatives of it, just like we would in another country as a citizen of the country we came from. To me, this means acknowledging that the earth is not really our home, that we are just strangers and pilgrims and foreigners here. Our real home is in heaven. Our point of origin and our point of destination, therefore, always has been and always will be heaven. Ephesians 2.9 says, Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. Therefore, as we realize and come into the open reality of the fact that we are called and created to function as sons of the living God, that gives us the capability of understanding that our true citizenship, our true home, is in heaven. A citizen, if, if we were to clarify the word citizen here, it means that I belong to a specific nation. If I'm a citizen of New Zealand, then I have a legal transaction right to be in that nation. I have legal ability to purchase and to be a participator and a partaker of everything that is to do with that nation. It means I also have a right to have a bank account, to have education, to have what is necessary for the normality of life. Also, when I travel, I travel as a citizen of that nation. So if, if we were to look and understand the same issue regarding being a citizen of heaven, it means this, that I have the full rights to be a partaker of all that belongs to that nation or to being a citizen of my father's world. It means I can be a participator, I can own stuff there, I can be a uh, be occupied with that and have a right to be there and have my passport or my passbook, which is salvation, to be in that world. If I'm a citizen of heaven, then not only am I a citizen, but I'm also an ambassador that represents that nation or that citizenship wherever I go. <laughs> to be a citizen of heaven, first of all, is to be born into heaven or to be born from heaven. We are born of God, right? People are citizens either by birth or by buying the citizenship or by being adopted into the citizenship. So to be a citizen of heaven, first of all, means look, we, we, the person, for a person to be a citizen of heaven must be born from heaven, right? To be a citizen of heaven now means there is no veil, no partition between me and heaven. So I can go anywhere if you have a passport, if you are a U.S. citizen, right, or you are a South African citizen, or you are a German citizen, or you are an Argentinian citizen, you can travel anywhere you want in the country as long as you're not a criminal, right? You can be stopped if you're doing something wrong, but it doesn't mean your citizenship gets revoked. You are dealt with as a citizen. You are giving privilege as a citizen. So being a citizen of heaven means that I have access to it, but it also, it also means for me that I have, not just I have access, I do have privileges. Number one, I have the privilege of being able to petition the King of Heaven. I have privilege of being able to enter any, anywhere I want in Heaven. So, on earth, I could run for offices, right? So, in Heaven, per training, I could be raised up to sonship, to mature sonship. That allows me to function and in that place God can decide to make me an ambassador for him in a particular realm of his creation so being a citizen of heaven comes with all the privileges being a citizen of heaven comes with the privilege of God saying I give you authority the Bible says this it says that for this is the inheritance of the saints and they shall judge the earth like right? the, the sword Psalm 149 the last verse 
See, this is the right of those who believe God to execute judgment upon the earth. So a citizen on earth, of heaven gets to a point where they have the right to execute judgment, where they have the right to rectify what has been broken, where they have the right to bring reconciliation. Where, are you getting, so, so that kind, that's what a citizen, being a citizen means. Because there's this responsibility, you know, for, for in, in that kingdom, through that kingdom, and for that kingdom. Why was the veil torn? Why was the veil torn? Let's talk a little bit about priesthood first. The function of a priest was to be able to do the exchange, to be able to redeem Israel from their record of corruption, sin, iniquity, transgression that had occurred through their year. So once a year, the high priest would actually have to go through the veil. The veil was not um, uh, many layered pieces of material. It was one big piece of material that was hung on, on, on a rail that had rings on it across the top, down the sides, both sides, and on the bottom. And you couldn't go underneath it. You couldn't go around the outside of it. It was, it was surrounding the Ark of the Covenant. And so the priest used to go through the veil. One man took him a year to get ready to go in there once a year to be able to do an exchange and mediate the release of Israel from its corruption for that year. When Christ died, of course, Christ was the only blood lineage priest left in Israel's day. The other one was John the Baptist, who was beheaded. When John was beheaded, the priesthood of Israel was given to Christ. Christ hung on the cross to mediate um, our ability to have unrestricted access into heaven. Part of that mediation was to tear the veil open so there was no way of separating us from God. That's why the word says, nothing can separate us from the love of God, neither height nor depth, nor principalities nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. If we are in Christ and where he is, we may be also, then we need to have that unrestricted, unconfined access through the veil which gives us the capacity to go in. And so Christ tore it from top to bottom. So we did not have to spend a year trying to get ourselves ready and make ourselves holy. He tore it open so that he can make us holy when we go in there. And so for me, when he tore it open, he tore it open. So we didn't have to dematerialize and rematerialize on the other side of the veil to be able to walk through solid objects. Yah Yahweh made it so easy. So we could have access. The veil was torn so that we wouldn't have to have mediators and tutors and teachers to be able to access heaven and to access the heart of the Father and to have relationship with God. The veil was torn so that we could walk with him the way his son walked with him while he was on the earth because we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ, and we have the same inheritance. Jesus said, everything that the Father has, he has given to me, and I now make it available to you through the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit declares over us what the Father has for us. It's everything. The veil was torn because Jesus wanted us to gain open access to God the Father himself. All the more reason why I can have courage and boldness knowing my access to the throne of God. The veil was torn, literally, so human beings no longer had to struggle from this side, not knowing what was happening on the other side. The veil was done so that we can have access to God with no one standing in between us, except the Son who himself is fully God. So it was done to give us complete, total access to the realm of God. All the angelic structures are open to us. God, actually, let me, let me be a little bit Jewish and say, the veil was done to allow us to live out of the fullness of the world to come in our present condition. What did Jesus mean when he said he made a way to the Father? I believe he meant that he is making available to us all the pathways through which he cultivated relationship with his Father and all the ways by which he could access the heart of God and know 
the heart and the nature of the Father. He made that available to us. The Word says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father except through me. The only way to gain access to the Father is through the Son, by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit. If we want access to the Father, we have to come, number one, through the blood of Jesus, by the sacrifice of Jesus, and in the name and the nature of Jesus Christ. He is our point of access. Likewise, however, we can only come to the Son through the Father. For the word says in John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sends me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, verse 65 says, He was saying, For this reason I have said unto you, No one can come unto me unless it has been granted to him by the Father. This is because the Trinity operates and functions as one. Therefore, the Son is the way to the Father, and the Father is likewise the way to the Son. He, did, he meant exactly what he said. What he meant is through the veil of his body, right? He opened up. Well, how do you, where, where is a person's thought in, inside of them? Christ is the inner thought of God. Christ is the Word of God. So, Jesus, by coming to the earth, provided a, can I say this? A physical, substantial reality that opens up into the heart of the Father. So what Christ, what Christ did by coming to earth and being obedient to the Father and laying down his life and going through death was to open up God's heart so we can see into God's heart. And God can then say, because, because our issue is we think God doesn't like us. I mean, really, human beings forget how they, we think we sin. The whole, even the Bible says we sin, so God has a problem with us. He's... God's been trying to get us back. But Jesus, when Jesus says, I've made a way to the Father, that means what I've done is I've actually removed the, what the Bible call it? I've removed the wall of partition. I've removed the anger that was against you. I've removed everything that made you think I can't come to God. So by his obedience, by his life, he completely fulfilled all of that and gives us access to the Father, so that we can also receive the grace to be exactly as He is. You know, Jesus did it for us. So we really have access through Christ into the fullness of God. Paul said it this way, he says, I pray that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So what Christ actually did was open the realm for us to become filled with the fullness of God, for us to become like our Father in heaven. What did Yeshua mean when he said he made a way to the Father? Um, for me, the because Yahweh is holy, he's omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent, because of the nature and the stature of who he is, we needed a mediator to be able to, be able to present us so that we would be acceptable to the Father. And so what Christ did for us was to mediate a way for you and I to be able to have unrestricted access to God himself through what Christ went through to make a way for us to be able to be where he is. How does our access to heaven enable us to bring heaven to earth? Number one, by accessing heaven, we are following Jesus' example in John chapter 5. When Jesus said of his own self, I, Jesus, the Son of God, of my own self can do nothing, only that which I see my Father doing. I do not speak of my own self, only that which I hear the Father saying. If Jesus of his own self can do nothing except that which he sees the Father doing and hears the Father saying, how do we think that we can accomplish anything of eternal purpose if we don't have the open access to see what the Father's doing and hear what the Father is saying? By following Jesus' example, we can bring heaven to earth through our decrees and our declarations. Job 22:28 says, Thou shalt also decree and declare a thing, and it shall be established unto you, and the light shall shine upon all of your ways. 
Isaiah 12, 4 says, In that day you shall say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare all of his doings amongst the people, and make mention that his name is holy. Isaiah 21, 6 says, For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Set a watchman on the wall, and let him declare what it is that he's seeing. Isaiah 41, 22 says, Let them bring forth and show us what shall happen and what is yet to come. Let them show also the former things, what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them all. Declare unto us the things that are yet to come. In Isaiah 42, 9, it says, Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things I am declaring. Before they spring forth, I will tell them to you. Isaiah 48, 6, You have heard, look at all this, and will you not declare the things that you've seen? I proclaim to you new things from this time on, even hidden things which you have not known, and you must then decree the things that you have seen. Ezekiel 40 verse 4 says, Son of man, behold with your eyes, hear with your ears, set your heart upon all that I am showing you. For this intent have I brought you up here, that I might show them to you. Declare all that you see. Therefore, our purpose in producing heaven and earth is, number one, to ascend into the heavens, to see the things that the Father is doing, to hear the things that the Father is saying, and then come back to the earth and decree and declare the thing that we saw him doing and heard him saying. Whenever we form our decrees and our declarations, we don't form them by our own precognition or by our own limited earthly understanding. In following the pattern of Jesus, we can only say the things that we see. We can only do the things that we hear. Therefore, when we ascend into heaven, it's empirically important that we decree and declare in the earthly realm the thing that we have seen there. How does our access to heaven enable us to bring heaven? Yahweh's desire has always been that heaven would be framed on earth. Christ even said, you will be done on earth as it is in heaven, not in heaven as it is on earth. The reason is, is that in heaven there was no corruption and no mark of falling or churning or um, being incapacitated by the iniquity that hangs around us here in our current physical form. I, I really believe that the reason that Yahweh wants the realm of heaven to be on earth is so that earth can come back to its first estate or come back into its original blueprint it is in a fallen estate. And so the reason our job is to bring that down here is to facilitate the administration of what we know there, here in the earth, to be able to be sons to govern creation in the right way. Heaven is not just about being sinless. It's also about the beauty of the world of God, the uh, unconfined majesty of the way that creation was framed through the very beginning if we live in a fallen reflection and we find beauty in this fallen reflection how much more when the completion of the fullness of that is able to be revealed down here again in that measure we will see the unfathomableness of Yahweh being framed within creation around us and to me that is bringing heaven to earth it's, it's Adam, Adam's job, walking Eden. Adam's job was to bring Eden and frame Eden on the earth. And that has not been completed yet. We are going to see its completion. And when it does come to full completion, we will have a new heaven and we will have a new earth. And we will have been part of creating that. The extent to which we understand how heaven, heaven operates and what goes on in heaven and what governs the heavenly realm is the extent to which we're going to be able to bring on earth what is in heaven we can't bring to earth what is in heaven if we've never accessed and never had uh, any insight into the ways and into the government and into the structure of heaven therefore it's important that we go up and down we ascend and descend in the spirit to be able to know what's there and to be able to bring it here so that what's here looks like that and that wants to be here because it's the same it's a thin, it's a thin air. It's a thin separation between the two. I believe that's the way it was in Solomon's day. 
It was so much like heaven on earth that heaven and earth were one in the temple and the priests could not go in. How do we access heaven? Oh, well, number one, by knowing Jesus. Number two, by practicing how to sit still, rest in God. So you know the one, knowing Christ, so by the principle of faith, Jesus said that he is the way to God, right? If I don't believe that, I cannot access. That's very, that's very fundamental stuff. But then I train myself to access. I can access heaven once I'm in Christ. I can access heaven by laying down in my bed and staying there and having a focus on Christ in between sleep and waking and actually letting my soul travel with my spirit into the realm of God. We actually access heaven by accessing Christ, <laughs> by focusing on Christ. So if I look unto Jesus, the author, I'm finish off my faith, I can access heaven. But there's a practical way in which I access the realm of the Father. I can't, I can't access heaven if I hate you. Whatever I access is not heaven. So, part of, again, we come back to the principle of love. I access heaven by love. There's all kinds of practical ways in which people actually go into the realm of the Father. Right? So, the spirit, the spirit that is in us is the spirit, is God. Right? And that spirit gives us access to the realm of heaven. So, I can access heaven by reverential awe. I can sit and remember talking about wonder by sitting in the days of wonder, by sitting in the times of God's wonder, I can actually access heaven. I can access heaven by leaving my body. I can access heaven by practical processes, by reading scripture actually. I can actually access heaven. I can access heaven by worshiping. Right? These are very simple things. But I can also access heaven by structuring the word of God according to the way that God created the world through the Hebrew letters for me. And it takes me into the heavenly realm. You know, I can access heaven by praying the Jesus prayer. Focusing until Christ becomes a reality and I find myself in another realm. You know, um, I can access heaven by speaking in tongues for two, three hours where my mind shuts down and my soul and my spirit moves. So access in heaven fundamentally can only be done through Jesus Christ. If you do not do it through Jesus Christ, you are accessing through the window. You are a thief. So you must come through the door. And when you now know who Christ is, we are now actually, we should actually be saying, instead of accessing heaven, how do I explore heaven? You know, so take for example, I'm not searching for God. Before you were a believer, you were seeking for God. Now that you have found God, your job is to explore God. So the, when we say actually we access heaven, we're actually saying, how do I explore heaven? Because once you come into Christ, heaven is open to you. So the issue is how do I explore? How do I go in and explore what it is that God has opened up for me? You know, I already have access to heaven. Every believer does. But most believers prefer to sit outside and watch as if heaven is closed. Since Christ came into the world, heaven has not been closed. Heaven has been open. So we have access. That's what he says. We have access through him. So, before you become a believer, Mr. Gene, you were searching for God. Once you have found God, your job is not to search. Your job is to explore. So how do I explore heaven? I explore heaven by rest. I explore heaven by wonder. I explore heaven by letting the love and intent of my heart flow towards the Father and I get drawn into his realm. Revelation 4.1 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in the heaven. And the verse voice which I heard were as of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up here, and I will show you many things, things that shall be hereafter. Verse 42, and immediately, 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 I was in the spirit. 
And behold, a throne was set in the heavens and one that sat on the throne. This is the door of heaven that has always been accessible to us. I want you to notice the fact that it says, immediately I was in the spirit. So how is it that we access the open door of Revelation 4? Immediately as we are in the spirit. This door has always been open, but it's by faith that we can access heaven through that open door. It's actually quite simple. By faith, you just close your eyes and you just believe that you are there. It's as simple as falling off of a log, really. Just by faith, you begin to see and write down all the things that you see so that when you return, you can decree and declare only the things that you saw so that the heaven then begins to manifest here on the earth. I've actually been training people in corporate ascensions now for over 20 years. And many of the people that have been consistently on a regular basis ascending and descending can now prove that the things they decree and declare in the earth are manifested in the earth within a period of seven days. These decrees and declarations show up consistently either in television reports or in the headlines of the newspapers because the people that I've been training for the last 20 years through their faithfulness to be consistent in ascending and descending have now gained a measure of rule in the heavenly realms. 2 Corinthians 6 says we are called to be co-workers and co-creators together with God for the establishment of his kingdom and his righteousness in all the earth. We can also access this open door through the blood and in the name of Jesus Christ. That is the key because Jesus is the door. If we really believe that he's gone in advance and opened the door and prepared the way for us that wherever he is, we may be also then it's no problem to understand that that means because he's ascended to the right hand of God the Father Almighty that we also have access to that because he lives in us. And wherever he is, we may be also. It's all about relationship with, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's about relationship with, with God and everything that God has made available for us to have relationship with from his realm of influence and government and authority. So... To access heaven, I believe the thumbprint that opens up that vault, the, the, the code, if you would, that gives us access into that realm is the relationship we have with the Father. That must be paramount. It cannot be just so we can say we went there, just so we can say we saw what's there, just so we can say we operate from that realm toward this one. It has to be because we love God so much through our union and our relationship together, Jesus said, make them one as we are one. Out of that oneness that God has with mankind, we're able to access heaven. So I think the, the, the access is, is done in a multiple of ways. First of all, it requires faith. We, we, which says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We must believe that he is and there's a reward of those that diligently sought him out. It requires faith for us to believe, number one, that Christ did what he did, which unlocks the law of faith. The law of faith is where Paul makes a statement, this life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's got nothing to do with us. So it's having faith in his faith that what he did was enough for us to bring us there. The second thing is, it's about intent. Our intent has got to be set into our Father's world the next link on all of this is desire. The, the desire is one of the key components to our access. Whatsoever a man desires, let him ask and pray and receive. Then, of course, hope is connected to it. What is my hope? Is my hope that I'm going to stay on earth, that I'm going to um, live here for 75 years, die an old person, and then go to heaven? My, my hope, I want to taste heaven now. I want to be in my father's world now if scripture is true it means i have access there now so i need to be able to position myself to be able to go there and so the, the way that christ has has opened that for us he's the door we go through the door to be in that world but it is a choice to go many many people stand this side of the veil i call them outies there's outies and innies an outie is someone who stands this side of the veil or won't go in, 
or has another that stands in front of them that tells them you can't go in. Like, I, I, and I hear, I hear this so often when, when people are saying, you know, you can't go into heaven. Well, you can. The reason even Christ confronted this when he said to the Pharisees, um, you know, you know the way. Those who want to go in, you deny them access, but you won't go yourself. And it's almost like that, that three, that's bent, that, I call it a bench of three. Those, those three things are the greatest hindrances to our future with regards to our accessing Yahweh's world. When Christ said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, take my yoke upon you and I'll give you a rest. And say, have this, we have to go. If Christ says, come to me, where is Christ? He's not on earth. The Bible says he's seated next to Yahweh in heaven. So if we go means go, you've got to go somewhere. So we have access through what he did through his death by tearing the veil, opening up to become our priest, the mediator that presents us to be able to be in Yahweh's world. And so we, through that process, through desire, through faith, through hope, through your intent to be in his world, it unlocks it and repositions us. I literally call it a, um, a a transfer from this world into that world through it's a birthing chamber through what Christ has done. And so Christ is our birthing chamber to be in that world. He birthed us into heaven to be a citizen of heaven, not birthed us into salvation to be a citizen of earth. When we operate in heavenly realms, are we able to have relationship with beings other than the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yes, just as much as when someone has relationship with me, they have relationship with my household. So people who stay at my house as my guests, who are primarily the relationships that I've cultivated or my wife and I have developed, they also have access to my children even to our dogs. <laughs> They're members of my household. We operate as a household. So everyone is accessible to an extent based on the relationship people have with us. It's like that. Yeah, we are. Because remember, heaven contains beings, forms of messengers, angelic beings, right? Seraphim, cherubim, ophanim, all the realms of creatures that actually serve in the kingdom of God. So when the Father opens up his realm to us, he opens up our capacity to relate to all the beings that he created. Because in reality, we are going to be, we are sons, which means we're going to rule. So if we're going to rule, then the Father will make, will make available to us opportunities of interacting with other beings and creatures that need our, what, our relationship with the Father in order to, to thrive. So, so moving in the heavenly realm allows us to interact with different beings. You're on earth. Don't you interact with other things? So then why will you go to heaven and not interact with other beings? That's exactly what the Father wants. So he uses the earth as a, as a pilot, in a sense, a module for how we are going to interact, because there are beings in heaven that we need to interact with. So everything on earth is actually training for how to actually reflect God's glory and reign in his realm of the heavens and know how to relate to the beasts of the field and all the other stuff. Yes, absolutely and totally. I think one of the greatest detriments in the body of Christ is where people say you can't relate to angels, but they talk to devils all day. So for me, I'd rather be in my father's world being preoccupied with his world than being in this world preoccupied with Lucifer's connection to this world. For me, the Bible says that we are surrounded with a great cloud of witnesses. Those cloud of witnesses are not people in this world trying to speak with us. They're in, an, in his world engaging with us. If they surrounded if we're surrounded by them, then it means that literally we are in an amphitheater where they are cheering us on. And if you don't want a relationship with all of those that have gone before you, then know a better way than what we have to be able to learn from what they've walked in, then we have a problem. For me personally. Um, if we're surrounded by them, in Galatians 4.1 it says, A son, though he being Lord of all, 
is under tutors and governors until the appointed time. If I am not made to have a relationship outside of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in heaven, then who are my tutors and my governors that pre prepare me to be presented to the Father as a fully-fledged son? So, of course, within that issue of being tutored, there are the seven spirits of Yahweh that tutor us about our functionality within Yahweh's house. So let's just look at Queen Esther here for a minute to give you a scriptural reference point. Queen Esther, the Bible says about Queen Esther, before she was married to the king, she was assigned seven choice maidens of the household of the king to train her in every aspect of being a maiden to the king and being um, being prepared to become un in union with the king, to learn about the function of his house, what it was there for. You and I have been assigned the seven spirits of Yahweh in exactly the same way to be prepared by them to be presented to the Father so that the Father could present us to creation. That's just the that's just the tutors. Who are the governors? The governors are the men in white linen that surround us, that have input into our lives, that want to see the strategies that Yahweh released through them completed in us. We're the last in the relay relay race. And they're sitting around us, cheering us on, engaging with us. I mean, all through the Bible, you know, I, I, we, we have this stupidity as believers where we read the Bible and we, like, let's take the book of Ezekiel, for example. We read the book of Ezekiel and we think we know Ezekiel because we've read a little bit about a portion of his life. You don't know Ezekiel at all. You only know what was written about him and what he saw. The only way to get to understand who the person is is to meet them. They're alive. They're not dead. They have passed on through death into another world, which is in Yahweh's world. If I am in Yahweh's world and they're in Yahweh's world, then let's see, there's a way of having a relationship. The same way as in this world, there are people around me and I choose, my friends, I choose to have a relational connection in the physical world around me. And the always world is as real as this world. And if they're in that world and I'm in that world, then I can choose relationships in exactly the same way. Absolutely. But my main focus always remains on seeing Jesus. In fact, our relationship with Jesus is greatly enhanced when we can see him as he really is and not in the limitations of who we think he is. The word says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In 1 Corinthians 15, 52, it says, In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 2 Corinthians 3, 18 says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Here's another verse that really speaks to me about ascension. It says, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. We now have been able to see through a glass darkly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, I see in part, but then I will know him as well as he knows me. However, in addition to seeing Jesus, the heavenly realms are so vast and so varied. You can have clear and very concise conversations with any of the members of the great cloud of witnesses. I've met many of them over the time, and they've given me great leading, direction, correction, instruction, advice. It's really, really amazing to hear from those that have laid the foundations for where we're going at this present time. In fact, the word says in Hebrews 6 and 7 that just as we without them cannot be made perfect, so they without us cannot be made perfect either. Therefore, the great cloud of witnesses are actively involved in working along with us to bring about the unfolding of God's sovereign and divine plan for mankind for all ages. They're working together with us in it, and they really, really get excited when we yield ourselves to their personal input. We can also actively encounter the seven spirits before the throne, the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, might, fear of the Lord, and the spirit of revelation. We can speak to them, and they can, in turn, speak to us and fill us with the wisdom and knowledge 
of God and the mysteries that cannot be understood in any other way. Most of the people with Global Ascension Network know for sure that the seven spirits before the throne are called by God to be our teachers, our mentors, our encouragers, to bring us into the fullness of our operation in our position at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. We also can have many encounters with angelic beings and with men in white linen, as well as with the great cloud of witnesses. Recently, I had a visit from one of the men in white linen who appeared in the earthly realm. I've had many encounters with them in the heavenly realms, but this one appeared beside my bed at three o'clock in the morning. For all the world, he looked like John Paul Jackson made out of light. I oftentimes wondered if it wasn't really him, because when we talk about the men in white linen, we consider them to be only the ancient patriarchs and those that went long before us. But now there is a merging, a beginning of an overlapping period between the coming together of both heaven and earth at one time. Therefore, we're going to begin to see and have visitations in the earthly realm that before had only been relegated to our experiences in the heavenly realm. We can also be taken backwards and forwards in time because we're no longer restricted to time or space or distance. Those are all earthbound paradigms. He's the God who was, the God who is, the God who ever shall be, all at the same time. Therefore, if we are in Him and He is in us, We are no longer restricted to time or space or distance. Neither are we restricted to the earthly realm because he made a way for us that wherever he is, we may be also. We can also see things that are coming and return to decree and declare those things and command them to manifest in the earthly realm. We can see things that were in the past. And actually, we can go back into the past and change the past not actually in the significant instance, but we can change the downflow of the damage of the effects that was done by that specific thing in the past. I have many, many testimonies where I actually went back into the past and changed the downflow of the destructive plans that came from specific disasters that occurred in the earth realm. There really is no limit on what the Lord will show us when we're in the heavens, provided that our motives are only to say what we see, not just to get some spiritually high goose bumpily feeling so that we can tell other people that we've been to heaven. It's all relative to our internal motivations and the intensity of our internal desire to become a co-worker and a co-creator together with God for the establishment of his kingdom. This would put us in the line with following the pattern of Jesus who could do nothing except that which he saw the Father doing. What does it mean to have a spirit man? I don't have a spirit man. I am a spirit being. So for me, I'm primarily created as a spirit being that has a soul, which is the mediator of the desire of my spirit man, which, and they both, as eternal beings, live in my body, which also can become an eternal being. It depends on how far you want to take your body and into what structure you you choose to weave the fabric of your creation because my body has the capacity to be redeemed. But I'm not a human being. I'm a son of God. The day I got born again, I ceased to be a human being. As a spirit son of God, my primary being is I am a spirit being. I don't have a spirit. I am a spirit that has a soul that lives in a physical body. The only reason I've got a physical body is so that my spirit man can interact with the physical world. The reason I have a soul is so, or the reason that my soul is in existence is the expression of my spirit man's breath to be able to create a mediator for itself through the physical body so my spirit man could retain information and produce life within creation around me through my physical body. So that's why out of my belly flows streams of living water. It comes from who I am. I am a spirit being, not a body being. It means that the limitations of our bodies cannot hinder us at all in our ability to do the Father's will and to accomplish His purposes on earth and even in celestial realms that I believe we're going to have governance over for all eternity. We are not limited by our bodies. Our spirit enables us to go where our body won't. 
when the word says that we were created in the image of God, one facet of that means that we are a tripartite being. Even as he himself is a trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we also are created in three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Just as all parts of the Trinity work together as one, but each part has their very unique administration and their very specific purpose inside of the Trinity, so we are three in one, with each specific part having its own specific administration and purpose. Exodus 33, 11 says, The Lord spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp to his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed out of the tabernacle. That's in Exodus 33, 11. But in Exodus 33, 20, which is only nine verses later, God says to Moses, You cannot see my face, for there shall no man see my face and still live. How can both of those scriptures be true both at the same time? It's because the Old Testament patriarchs understood clearly the separation of flesh and spirit. They understood that your spirit could live in an ascended position with God and have face-to-face communication with Him at the same time as your body and soul were relegated to the earth realm to function in the earth realm for their own unique purpose. The purpose of our spirit man, then, is to stay in constant communication with the divine nature while the purpose of our soul and body are to function here on the earth realm. We have a celestial body, which is our spirit man, and a terrestrial body, which is our soul and our body. This is called, in mystical terms, bilocation. That means we can function in both realms at the same time, without uh, simultaneously without any conflict at all. Actually, most of the Old Testament patriarchs understood this well. That's why Isaiah could stand and say, I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. That is not just a simile. He actually was there, and he actually saw the Lord. Many of the Old Testament prophets and seers had those ascending experiences. It was only as the church fell into a state of lower levels of understanding when signs and wonders and miracles stopped that we lost the understanding of separation of flesh and spirit. What is the purpose of going to heaven? To have greater intimacy and face-to-face relationship with the Father. To have experience of the realm of God that allows you to be able to to look into the blueprint of who God is Mm -hmm. and to bring that on earth and manifest it in creation. The purpose of going into heaven is to look until we are framed in the full testimony of the voice of our Father. So that His face gets reflected in our face. And when we turn around and look into nature, in creation, creation now receives the blessing of that face into itself. Because we are the sons of God and we are the ones that are supposed to look into the face of God, we go into heaven, we look face to face, we experience the, the, the blueprints of God, and we bring those blueprints and imprint them on the earth or on creation. That's the purpose. The purpose is intimacy with God that results in what? In the transformation of creation, in the rectification of creation, in the maturing of creation, in the revelation of God in creation. So that's what we do. That's why we go to heaven. We don't go to heaven just to go and say, I need a car. Can I go to heaven and tell God to give me a car? No, that's not how it works. It works that way. That's what you want. But the real purpose, Christ came to from heaven to earth to reveal the Father. We go to heaven so that we might be able to reveal the Father in creation also. We were given a responsibility to steward everything that God created and to have dominion over it. I don't believe we can effectively have dominion over everything God created by operating by just what's on the earth and even just the word itself, even though it is complete and it has all these things that we need. I believe we also have access, we were given access and we should utilize that access to be able to be effective as ambassadors of heaven on earth 
and to be able to maximize our potential as sons on the earth. For me, the greatest reason why I want to access heaven is because by doing so, I come into full awareness of my identity as priest and king, but especially as son. And it's from that place that every accomplishment, every achievement flows. I think for me, the purpose is primarily to follow Jesus' example. When he said, I of my own self can do nothing except that which I see the Father doing. Our purpose is to do only the thing that we see the Father doing and to say only the thing that we hear the Father saying. Our purpose then as co-workers together with God is to decree and declare in the earth realm what we see and hear in the heavenly realm. On a personal level, my purpose is to become more and more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ by becoming what he is, which is love. There are only four nouns ascribed to God. One is God is spirit. The second is God is fire. The third is God is love. And, you know, I think that if we really understood that our purpose is to be conformed to his image, which is love. Love is a frequency. And when we can begin to vibrate with the frequency of love, no matter where we go, no matter what we do, even people that we speak to who don't know Jesus, pick up on the love of God that emanates from the frequencies of our heart. And their hearts respond because one of the needs of all humankind is the need to be loved. I feel like for me, the most intentional purpose of ascending and descending is to be conformed to Jesus Christ. You know, he's so multidimensional, so multi, 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 multi everything, that every time that we ascend into the heavenly realms, he extends to us one dimension or one facet of his character. When we touch that one facet of his character, then when we return to the earth, we can actually manifest that position of his character. To me, this is becoming what he designed for us to be, which is the perfect reflection of his glory in all the earth. What does it mean that the kingdom of heaven is at hand? What he meant when Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he was saying the kingdom of God that is within you is in front of everyone. And so the kingdom of heaven is not something you should look for to come when you die or in some distant time down the timeline. It's here in front of you. And because the kingdom of heaven is within us, me being in front of you is a, is a manifestation of the kingdom of heaven. So to the world, we should say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You're looking at it. It means that the kingdom is as close as our next breath, as close as our very next heartbeat. It's not just a place way out there somewhere. Uh, the kingdom is within. The kingdom has always been at hand, as close as our next breath. Well, the kingdom of heaven is an is that, we, look, the kingdom is not that far. It's not, see, the thing about entering into the heavenly realm is not that you have to travel somewhere to do it. You don't even have to be so seriously spiritual. All you need to do is turn your heart, the, 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 the desire of your heart, your heart's intent, because the gate to Zion, the road to Zion is in your heart. Eternity is in your heart. So when he says the kingdom of God is at hand, the kingdom of God is as close as the five fingers, right? In your hand, which is the, okay, there are two sides. So one finger this side, one finger this side. So the kingdom of God is as close as the first five principles of existence. <laughs> so that when you look at, uh, when you look at it, okay, your you're, 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 you're turning your intent, just shifting a little bit, allows you to enter into the kingdom. You don't have to work for 20 years to enter the kingdom. The kingdom is really a shift of consciousness. So it's as close as the next thought. You can change your next thought and shift it and be in the kingdom of God. So the, the hand... Uh, the hand is the thing you use to wipe your face is the thing that you that is closer to you you can you do a lot of stuff so when you focus on your hand you okay there's something i'm going to say here because your hand carries the scroll 
the kingdom of God is also at your hand. The scroll of heaven is in this palm that you carry around. So, when you use your hand, literally, to bless somebody, you manifest the kingdom. Because the scrolls of heaven transfer into the life of the person. So, being at hand, the Jew will understand that. Because it's like, the kingdom of God is at hand. When you do mitzvot, the kingdom is manifested. When you love somebody, so one act of faith pushes you into the realm of the kingdom. So the kingdom really is close to you. You can just shift your face by one act and enter and shift it back to this realm. The kingdom of God walks by your side in this physical realm. You can step in and out of it in ordinary days. So it is that close. It's closer to you than the breath that you breathe. What is the biggest misconception about heaven? That it's for tomorrow and I won't see it until I die. That to me is the biggest misconception of heaven. The other thing is that um, there seems to be this prevalent misconception that all heaven is is a one big mountain and everybody worshipping God forever. That is, that is what we will be doing on our day off. Every seven days heaven closes down. Why? To worship Yahweh. And then we join with him while he worships in his own mountain. Because Yahweh worships in his mountain. So if it's good enough for Yahweh to worship, then we can have a time of worship. But there's work to do. It's not just about oh, sing, playing my harp in the cloud forever. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that there's work to do. As I said, there's two trillion galaxies and counting to take care of. Who's going to take care of it? Us. From my experience, the biggest misconception about heaven is this superimposing of earthly realities over our perception of what heaven is. In other words, we box out heaven based on our limited experience of how the earth operates. And we want it to be like what this is or what we think this is. So it's, it's funny to me when people who haven't traveled anywhere and haven't seen anything want to tell me about all these distant lands that I've actually been to or different places where I've actually functioned without ever having been there. Well, that's what people do. The biggest misconception about heaven is making it look like earth in our minds. I feel like the biggest lie that has ever been perpetrated against the age of the church is that the only way that you can see heaven is to die. It is and always has been available to us at any given time. All throughout history, there have been a 10% measure of people who had a different level of relationship with God Almighty. In the Old Testament, this 10% would be called the remnant. In the New Testament, this 10% would be called the overcomer. There are always those who have a deeper, more intense desire to know the things of God and to know the things of heaven. Because in times past, many of those people were persecuted and actually murdered for the fact that they laid hold of some of the mysteries of heaven. The issue is that today the mystical move of God is underway. And no man can stop it. No religion can stop it. No government can stop it. Nobody can stop the fact that we can now ascend and descend from the heavenly realms. What does it mean to be a mystic? To be a mystic, number one, is to be one who seeks out the depth of God. Who seeks not to be told what God looks like. One who seeks to have an actual relationship with God an intimacy with God, one whose heart seeks union with God, one whose heart seeks to, 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 to become, in a sense, to become one with the Father. So, mystery is to be one who's interested in the mystery of who God is, in the mystery of what God has done, in the mystery of God's wisdom. So, a mystic, a mystic is one who traffics in divine mystery. So I want to know God. Since God is a mystery, my whole life is lived in the context of mystery, of engaging the mystery of God's being. Love is a mystery. We think we know what it is. We don't. You know, so when I engage love, I engage in the depth of God. 
So God, God is a mystery in himself. So one revelation of God leads to another revelation of God, leads to another revelation of God. So someone who's a mystic spends their time and their energy entering into the depth of knowing God. They want to have a face-to-face -face encounter. They want to have an experience of God. They don't just want to have somebody tell them what God looks like. They don't want to hear somebody else's voice. They want to enter in. They want to explore the Father's heart. They want to explore the heart of Jesus. They want to explore the heart of what the Holy Spirit is doing. So a mystic really is someone who searches for the height, the breadth, the width, the depth of God's heart. You seek God. So a mystic. A mystic then that search results in the person being able to leave their body, being able to see angels, being able to experience the realms of heaven. That means a person who's a mystic can be walking down the road and look to a tree, and that tree becomes a gateway into the realm of God. A real mystic meets a man on the road and sees how the person greets the person, hears the person's voice, and sees righteousness in another believer, and that believer becomes a gateway for experiencing the fullness of God. A real mystic doesn't look at the things in the world in the ordinary sense. They don't look at scripture in its ordinary sense. For a mystic, the Bible is a gateway to the heart of God. It's not just something, a story to be read about the land of Israel. Yeah, right, it's true, it is so, but it is a gateway into the soul, the, the mystery of God, to the mystery of God. So for a mystic, touching someone can trigger an experience of divinity. <laughs> you know, for a mystic, walking down the road, looking at a flower, could open up colors of the heavens. So the, the, a mystic walks in the, in the awe and the wonder of God. To a mystic, the whole universe embodies awe and wonder. It, it, the whole universe carries the mystery of the wonder of who God is. So, so the mystic is constantly being awed. And so he or she wants to find out more about God. Because to them, life is a wonder. God is a wonder. So when he talks about, you know, that, he's a, that, that God is wonderful, the mystic operates, works in wonder. When we talk about signs and wonders, walks in awe, wants to see God face to face. He engages angels. He understands that this life is not the end of anything. And this life is just a gateway. And then it, for him, those who are dead are not dead. They are in the presence of the Lord and he can have access to them because he had access to Christ. So a mystic really is a strange person who burns with the fire of the Lord. Their eyes are open, their ears hears. When their tongue speaks, it speaks from the place of God's heart and God's love. A mystic speaks language that is different from the language of ordinary people. He loves, and the greatest gift of a mystic is the love of God that burns in his heart. It burns so strongly that everything in the universe to them can be used as a gateway to God. So they live in transforming love. For me, a mystic is one who has the capacity to unlock the mysteries of Yahweh where there is no language or expression or knowledge of what is being revealed. The word says, I has not seen or you heard of things that God has or Yahweh has in store for them that love him. Which means that no doctrine, no belief system, no knowledge, no information is available to be able to blueprint or be able to explain uh, um, unseen behavior. And being a mystic is, is being given the ability to display it so that others can see the mystery in full revelation. A mystic to me is someone who has the capacity to be able to obtain the secrets of Yahweh to unlock the unknown so it becomes known 
to be able to engage with the unknowable so the unknowable becomes known. First and foremost, it doesn't freak me out because I believe a mystic is someone who explores, discovers, values, pursues the mysteries of God. Someone who recognizes that what I see and what I hear and what, I, what my perceptions are of everything that's around me is not it, that there's more. And that more lies in the invisible realm that I have access to through relationship with my father. And I want that. And so a mystic is someone who pursues what lies beyond what we see and what we understand according to what is around us. A mystic explores the hidden part of God that is very much available to those who seek him in spirit and in truth. This is the question I love to address because I begin to release revelatory mysteries from God while we were still firmly planted in the age of the church. At that time, one of the most major accusations against me was that I was just nothing but a mystic. I came before the Father crying, saying, Lord, they're all saying that I'm a mystic and I'm weeping and thinking that's a really bad thing to be. And the Lord's response was, do you even know what a mystic is? Why don't you go and look it up? So I went to Webster's and I looked up the word mystic. There are actually 28 different definitions of what a mystic is, and only two of those relate to Eastern cults. Actually, I chose the very first description for myself, which is a mystic is someone who receives supernaturally derived information through communion with the divine nature. After that, when people would come up to me and say, well, you're just nothing but a mystic, I would just rejoice and shake their hand and say, thank you very much. I'm so glad that you can acknowledge that I have communion with the divine nature. Even in regards to those old accusations, one accusation that was leveled against me is, well, you're teaching New Age and you're teaching channeling and all that kind of thing. And I crawled before the Father weeping and crying because these were big, globally recognized apostolic and prophetic names that were making these accusations. So I came before the Lord and I said, Lord, they're saying that I'm teaching New Age. Is it really true? Am I really teaching New Age? And he just laughed. And he says, well, after all, my darling, it is a new age. Praise the Lord for that. So what does it mean to be a mystic? It means that you are one who diligently seeks communion with the divine nature. Through our seeking of that communion, the Lord can give us the responsibility or release to us mysteries that have been hidden in Christ since the very beginning. I'm here to say today that at globalascensionnetwork.net, one of the things that the Lord is now beginning to release is the mysteries of God that have not yet been plumbed. Actually, all of them can be found in the Word of God. Up until now, we've been limited in our understanding of what the Word of God means because we've only known in part, seen in part, prophesied in part because we were looking through a glass dimly. This was actually by divine design. The Lord put that glass there because he cannot show us the measure of power he intended us to function in until we can become responsible enough to exercise that power with due control. Actually, if he had released an understanding of how much power he created us to work in, we would have destroyed the world many times over already because our corporate heart had not yet been dealt with by the cross. Therefore, today, the Lord is saying he's rallying the mystics all over the earth because he's given to each one of us a very, very significant word that will be enfolded into the wholeness of the picture of the unfolding of his divine design for all humanity. Aren't the seven spirits seven expressions of the Holy Spirit? Um, does the Bible say the seven expressions of God? It does not. It says the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits of God are not sitting on the throne. The Bible says they are seated all they are before the throne of Yahweh. This random is the seven colors. They testify to the blueprint of pure white light fractured into the seven colors of the rainbow to display their mark and their all mark within creation to bring us back to pure white light. 
So when we are tutored by them, what is the accumulation of all of what they become? We become, through their tutelage, white light to be presented to the Father. Of course, Christ is at the center of this, because without him, there's no access to them in the first place. And so, I, I, you know, many, many years ago, 20 years ago, when I started engaging with the seven spirits of God as, as individual entities that all have a function, all have a role, people seem to be very... Uh, reticent to actually speak the truth and a lot of it comes out of because they don't see themselves they don't encounter themselves and it's because there there is knowledge that uh, that does not have expression in the middle of it in relation to heaven what changes when we are born again the bible says to as many as believed him to them gave he the privilege to become even the sons of god being born again makes us sons and as sons, we are heirs according to the promise. Not just the Abrahamic promise, but everything that the Father has that He has made available to the Son by the Spirit becomes ours. Becoming born again, becoming born of the Spirit, is what enables us to come into the kingdom as sons. And then we have all the rights and privileges, but also the responsibility of sonship. Where is the Father? <laughs> He's everywhere. He is everywhere. And yet he is not as easily seen and recognized and found in everything because it takes relationship to access him in the different realms in which he operates. But above all, he's here. He lives inside of us. By the Holy Spirit, we have access to the Father in here. Can you describe an experience that you've had in heaven? Oh my goodness. There are so many experiences I've had in heaven. It would take me years to tell you about them all. I've actually been ascending and descending for over 35 years now. But I can tell you about my very first known ascension experience. It was back in the 1980s and I was at a prayer meeting at a church that I belonged to at that time. My pastor laid his hands on my eyes and said, Lord, give her the eyes of an eagle that she can see her prey while it is yet afar off. When he did that, I slammed down to the floor and my eyes were completely sealed shut. I began to listen in two realms, both into the heavens and into the earth at the same time. And I was getting into a lot of confusion because the people in my prayer group didn't know what to do with me. I was on the floor and I couldn't open my eyes. And so I asked my pastor, I said, could you just dismiss the prayer meeting and let everyone go home? And I'll stay here by myself until the Lord finishes because I know there are some things he wants to tell me. So he dismissed the prayer meeting. And as soon as I heard the latch on the door, I went into the heavenly realms and I actually came out speeding like a million miles an hour through this blue white tube chute and I came out with my arms outstretched like this face down in the sea of glass. When I lifted up my head I saw the feet of Jesus before me and I knew that it was him and so just out of awe and wonder I put my head back down in the water and I heard the voice of the Lord say look at me but I had seen him once before when I gave my life to Jesus and I knew that his light was so extremely brilliantly blue-white. I was a little bit intimidated and so I kept my face down. The second time he said, I said, look at me. And again, I just barely lifted my face up to see his feet. Then I put my face back down in the water. The Lord then reached down and picked me up underneath my arms and set me on my knees and he took his hand and put it under my chin and forced my face up and said, I said, look at me. And when I looked at him, his radiance, and he was just so stunning and so brilliant and so beautiful, just an explosion of blue-white electric light. He looked at me and he said, are you ready? And I said, yes, Lord. He said, are you ready? And I said, yes, Lord. Are you ready? And I said, yes, Lord. With that, a brilliant shining sword flew out of his mouth and he took the sword in his two hands and he lifted it up over the top of my head. When he lifted it up over the top of my head, he went 
bang down through my body and my whole body disappeared and the outside of my body formed kind of a rainbow brilliance and inside of me I could feel the sword with all of its electric power going just like that and finally my mortal body couldn't stand anymore and I went into excruciating pain so I cried out to the Lord and I said Lord take it away I can't take any more please take it away and with that he raised the sword up and bit by bit my body's view came back into a position again the second time the Lord asked me are you ready and I said yes Lord are you ready I said yes Lord are you ready I said yes Lord and with that he took the sword again lifted it above my head and went bang right down through the top of my head into my body again my body disappeared and all that I could see was the outline of it covered by a rainbow inside of my body the sword was going just like that I could feel the intensity of it in my mortal body and it produced such pain that I started to scream and cry and writhe on the church floor crying out to the Lord Lord I can't take any more please take it away during the course of that night there were seven different occasions when he asked me are you ready are you ready with each time he would take that sword and lift it over my head and jam it down into my body with full force I could feel the sword just shaking and just the electrical power of it inside of me was throwing my whole body into tilt seven times during the course of that night he asked me are you ready are you ready are you ready Finally, at the end of the night, I lay completely spent on the church floor. I was wringing wet from crying and screaming in pain because I could feel in my mortal body this sword coming down into my body. After the seventh time, I looked up and I said, Lord, what is this? And he said, this is that. And I said, that what? I don't understand what that is. And he said, these are the seven judgments. You've been judged and found ready. Now for the eighth time, he said, are you ready? And I said, yes, Lord. Are you ready? Yes, Lord. Are you ready? Yes, Lord. And with that, he took the sword and his arms, which were like bright, brilliant, shining white electrical bolts of lightning, put the sword in my hand and fused my hand to the sword. I was then standing in a military stance with my hand straight up in the sword out in front of me like this. And he said, now turn around and look. And I turned around and looked, and there was an entire army of people in perfect military positioning standing with their swords completely upright like this. And he says, now I want you to go and do the thing that I created you to do. This one experience set off a tectonic shift for me in the realms of the spirit. From that day forward, the Lord opened up doors all over the world for me to minister. Since that time, I've been to somewhere over 110 nations, ministering in power to governmental heads, to presidents, to kings, to the richest of the rich and the poorest of the poor. Everywhere that I go, that sword is in my hand and in my mouth. Whenever you have an experience that changes your entire spiritual walk on the earth, it's one that you never, ever, ever forget. There are those moments where you have the divine upward calling of God that can bring that tectonic shift. I've had many, many of those, and I could go on for a year about how my ministry has shifted with each one of those significant experiences. However, the truth of the matter is, we can choose by our own will to just close our eyes and ascend on a daily basis. I recommend to people that they get into a regular corporate ascension group because there are doors in heaven that can only be accessed by a corporate ascension. There are things that can be revealed in the corporateness or in the oneness when we go as one body, one spirit, one mind, with one word. 
As we all use our significant voices to share the things that we're seeing together, it gives us a much broader picture of the things that the Lord is desiring for us to do. And when we come down as a group, as one body, with one voice, and we make our decrees and declarations to the heavenly realms, the things that we decree and declare manifest on the earth. When people come to me and they say, are you telling us there's no such thing as rapture? I say, oh no. I'm caught up in the moment in the twinkling of an eye and carried away every day to stand face to face with Jesus Christ, to sit down at his banqueting table, to take my rod of authority, to take my crown, to take my robe, to come back here and put every enemy under my foot. I do believe in rapture. I get raptured every day. And I want to encourage everyone else to do the same because the more responsible you are and the more faithful you are to seek the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, the more faithful he is to release into you the mysteries of God that have been hidden in Christ since the very beginning. I had an encounter when I was uh, sleeping one day with the Father, the God of the Bible, the God of heaven and earth, my creator, in a dream. And in that dream, I knew that I was far from God, that I needed to commit my life to him, and then I needed to give him the rest of my life completely. And when I woke up, I was a different person. So it started that in, with that level of mystical substance. And I can't change the subject since then. I can't tone it down to try to make it an experience that comes out of a church building or a church program or some kind of religious exercise. I encountered the Father and it changed everything. And it only grows from there. To, to, pick, to pick one out and to say that it was better than all the rest, I don't think I could do that because they all are very unique and all very revelatory and most of them very personal. I think one of my greatest my greatest encounters was with, with Yeshua himself. I had spent two years getting to know the Holy Spirit um, every day tethered into getting to know him and I learned about who he was. And then the Holy Spirit one morning said to me, it's time for me to meet Jesus. And I was like, okay, didn't really know what that meant, had no reference point. I was in a, another church system that didn't believe in a quarter of what I was going through, didn't talk to anyone about it. And so that morning in my, in my home, in my lounge, in my house, in my room, I was engaging with the presence of God and um, everything transitioned out, overlaid in the physical world till I found myself sitting on a beach. And I was, first of all, like shocked then was like what's going on and then was amazed and I because I've always learned that when something unlocks there's more going on than what I'm just seeing and observing so I was just sitting there engaging with the presence of God observing what was going on around me and it was almost like a pixelated out of this world to that world and I felt this movement behind me. You know, when the word says that Adam heard the voice of God walking, it's in a conscious awareness of the presence of another that's moved in through the feeling of their presence, not the knowledge of them being there. And I, fe I felt, I felt Christ, and I'm, I was freaked out at that stage because I believed, you know, no man can see God and live. I didn't want to look at Christ because I was going to die. And I had a young family and I didn't want to die. I mean, all this religious garbage. In the, in the end, I came to the realization that if I died, I couldn't die in any better place. So I'm going to look anyway. And so I turned around. And when I did, Christ was kind of standing there like this. So, so the arms folded. And, and I, I just looked at him and I was, I was like, what do I do? And he, he does this to me. And I, you know, I, I'm like, what, what on earth does that mean? And, and, I, and of course, I, so all these things went through my brain. You know, what do I do? What do I do? How do I say hi? 
hi, I'm Ian, you already know I'm Ian. This is a bit of a stupid conversation to have. I'm going through all these natural things in my head, and there's a little thing in my back of my head said, said you know, where the scripture says, be ye imitators of God. And I was like, okay, so if I don't know what to do, I just do what I saw him do, and then it's going to all be good. So I did this back to him. And I mean, I'm like, what, what else do I do? Because I, didn't know, I did not know what to say. And then he does that to me again. And I went, okay, well, I'll do it back to you. And then he walks up to me and does this to me, kind of from here. And I did that. He picks me up and he takes me to the sea and throws me into the water in the sea. You could understand this was messing with all of my theologies. This is the, the God of the universe, Christ, the Son of God, picking me up and throwing me into the water on the beach that had materialized through my engagement with God. And I was like, well, what, 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 what do I do? So I stood up and just looked at him. He looked at me, walks up to me, picks me up and throws me back in the water again. And I'm, remember, I'm a guy. Okay, you can only take so much of this stuff. And I was like, dang, yeah, you're not going to do that again, buddy. And so what began as a interactive connection, I wrestled with Christ for about half an hour in the water, having fun laughing throwing each other around, laying flat in the water, dumping one. It was an amazing experience. At the end of that time, he looked at me and then he said to me, let's go and sit. So we walked out of the water, sat on the beach, and he said to me, I want you to know me as a friend and not just as the Lord of heaven and earth. And that began a relational connection with Christ that moved my life, shifted me. I mean, there's so many things like that in my life that Yahweh has brought me into because I set my heart to engage. It didn't happen over a day. This was years of walking through process. Do you have anything to say to those who are watching? When we talk about being Christian mystics, people think it's something so weird, but it's not. The day you gave your life to Jesus Christ and you said, I am now born let me use your term, born again. You're now saying, I'm no longer the person I was yesterday. You have already started practicing mysticism because you believe that you have actually crossed the Rubicon into another kind of existence. And having crossed that Rubicon, you're now actually, you are a heavenly being. You are in the heavenly realm, in Christ, exploring. But the issue is you're not going deep enough right so the key then is start going deep start asking for more start seeking for more start saying i want to know what is in your heart christ see that stuff your that prayer you're praying i want to know you more is actually the prayer of the heart of a mystic now that thing you're saying i want to see the father's face you really are already starting on a mystical journey you may not know that but that's what you're doing because that is the basic structure of mysticism is to see the face of the father i want to see your face okay so and when you begin to do that you will notice there are things that will happen to you you will be praying and flashes of lightning will come around you and you will think something's wrong with my eyes nothing is wrong with your eyes you have actually access realms of light angels will cross your path in your house as a shadow but they are not shadows. They are actually beings that are now coming closer to you because you've moved from the realm of being an ordinary human being to being one who's been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, who's becoming a reflection of the image of your Father in heaven. So you, you think about that. You are mystical by your salvation. You are now becoming mystical because Christ is taking you into the journey of experiencing the Father through Himself. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, oh, excuse me, you're already practicing mysticism. You're speaking in tongues. It says, He that speaks in tongues speaks mysteries unto God. So now, I want to encourage you, when you begin to have experiences, let's say you're laying down, and it looks like you're being pressed. This is what you've been told in your Christianity. If you lay down and it looks like you're being pressed, that means the devil is attacking you. But really, most of the time for a believer, 
When there's that kind of pressure, it means your soul is trying to leave your body to try to experience. You're, you're trying to have an out-of-body experience. And your physical body is pressuring your soul, saying you can't go anywhere because if you go somewhere, I'm going to die. It's happened to you, and you wake up, and you start binding the devil. But really, if you learn how to actually handle it, when that happens to you, and you wake up, go back to sleep, and gently breathe. And say to yourself, I release myself to experience the mystery of God. And notice what happens with you. How you begin to open up. Your soul is hungry to experience the realms of the Father. So most people think they are dying when that happens. When in fact the other realm is calling for experience. Look, we are in this journey together. The experience of God is your birthright. Entering into the heart of the Father is your birthright. Exploring the heavenly realms is your birthright. Interacting with angelic beings and all the structures of angels is your birthright. Jesus bought that for you with his blood. Opened up the gates of heaven for you to come in. The Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you on your exploration of his inner being as his son and his beloved. Amen. There's much opposition that comes to this way of thinking, to our perspective, and to our pursuit. And what we've learned through all of the opposition, all of the persecution, is to love. We've learned how to love more through persecution than through success and support and celebration of our gifting and of our achievements. So to everyone who opposes this message, who opposes who we are, what we carry, what we're proclaiming to the nations, I say the only thing you're gonna find from us is love. The unconditional agape love of God, that's what will change things. First of all, it's not easy. Secondly, it takes time. It's a good cheese. Because we hear something, we want it, and when it doesn't happen in two weeks, we think that it's never going to happen. I've been at this for 38 years, 38 years, which means that it's good cheese, it's good process, it's line upon line, precept to precept, glory to glory. I say to people, don't try and be spiritual, try and be active relationally with Yahweh. Set your heart to begin to engage relationally in a deeper level, but don't just do it out of reading the Bible. Do it out of wanting to build relationship. Reading the Bible doesn't make you build relationship. Make you build relationship means doing life together. And so one of the key things for me in all of this is go and do life with God. Get to the point where you know He's with you. The Word says, you go and I'll be with you. Get to know where he's with you, what it's like to have him with you through your daily life, all day, not just for an hour in the morning is a quiet time. Yahweh wants to be with us all day, to abide with us, we in him, and him in us, so that together we can frame his world in creation. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. Let me know if you have any questions or comments in the comment section below. And feel free to check out the websites of all the people that contributed to these interviews. Have a good one.